and all the best everyone. Well, welcome back uh, to the first panel discussion of the Synergy series. The theme, as all of you know, is the transitions in the urban Qatar landscape. So for the first session, we wanted to keep, shed light on the future of green infrastructure in Qatar. Now, as all of you are aware, one of the four pillars of Qatar National Vision 2030, which is the long-term development plan, is environmental sustainability. So in today's session, the panel of experts will shed light on the strategies and the practices the industry has been taking to work towards the vision and also explore the opportunities and the challenges faced by the sector. This session is sponsored by NG Coffee Manai, a part of NG Group. They provide the sustainable energy and service, services solutions and are the trusted partner for companies, industries and local authorities that are engaged in the carbon neutral transition. So before we start, I want to introduce this, our uh, speakers and the panel to all of you, uh, starting with Mr. Doyon Kim. He's a senior sustainability professional from the Qatar Foundation. Mr. Doyon has broad experience in the sustainable built environment, the climate change, corporate sustainability, and sustainable energy systems. He has delivered various mega scale sustainability projects in Qatar, UAE, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia since 2008 and he's currently dedicated to climate change and the carbon management of Qatar Foundation and Education City. We also have with us Mr. Sanjeev Bhatia, the chairman of SP Group, the CEO of Netix Global BV. Mr. Sanjeev Bhatia has a strong focus on solutions for sustainable smart buildings, smart cities, and energy efficiency, including an intelligent integrated command and control center for remote monitoring and management of facilities. He is the force behind an impressive portfolio of companies offering cutting edge products and services across the Middle East, Europe, Asia Pacific, and the USA. Also joining this panel this afternoon with us is Mr. Alan Rowland, the CMCA, AMS, and PCAM. He's a seasoned management executive owning more than three decades of extensive experience in the property management, real estate, and construction sector and he has mastered building world-class community strategy and management, and is a leading visionary involved in some of the biggest and most challenging community management projects, delivering innovative, sustainable, and customized solutions. Also with us this afternoon is Mr. Mohammed Sadeh, the GM of Darvish InterServe FM. Mr. Mohammed is an experienced general manager with 20 years of demonstrated history of working in the property and facilities management industry and real estate development. He is responsible for achieving strategic business goals that improves efficiencies, reduces costs, and moves business forward. He has an unparalleled dedication to providing exceptional building management, developing and implementing policies and procedures to drive maximum user service and satisfaction while achieving company goals. And last but not the least, we also have with us Mr. Adi Ranj, uh, Rajan, the general manager of NG Kofli Manai. With over 20 years of global experience in critical service providers, he was able to achieve quite a few milestones. And he has always been an integral part of the leadership team with hands-on experience to implement various strategic initiatives, business development and marketing, product and customer operations, life cycle management, and so forth. And he has successfully delivered various organizational transformation programs for agility and experts and growth for critical service providers. So welcome panel and viewers, please note to use the chat box to drop in your questions during the course of the discussion so that I can take in as many questions as possible. So let's start the discussion. Now, as I said, a key aspect of environmental sustainability and green living is its multifunctionality. Specifically, its ability to deliver a wide range of environmental, economic, and social benefits. So I want to start this discussion off by asking each one of you on a very basic, yet a very broad question. What does environmental sustainability mean in a region like Qatar? Does anyone want to start the discussion? Mr. Doyen, do you want to start off? Sure, I can start. Uh, first, uh, thank you 
for your introduction and I appreciate your invitation to this great conversation with excellent panelists today. Of course, uh, sustainability, the environmental sustainability means uh, protecting a natural environment, global ecosystem, and uh, biodiversity while uh, uh, balancing with uh, economic and social sustainability and prosperity. We understand, this is especially when talking about Qatar, Qatar is a quite a resource intensive economy and society. And so it's a very vulnerable environmental risk. The economy of Qatar heavily depends on natural resources such as an oil and gas industry. A large portion of our consumer product and building materials are imported from the overseas. Therefore, there are a lot of added environmental impact on shipping material to the country. Social and lifestyle wise, it requires large energy consumption and environmental footprints, especially for space cooling and also energy intensive desalinated water. Um, environmental sustainability in Qatar calls for a, a paradigm shift now in industry and civil society. The industry needs to actively find a way to limit environmental burden while sustaining their hydrocarbon-based business. They need to introduce new environmental, uh, environmental friendly technology and follow environmental regulation, which is getting more stringent. Without assurance of such environmental sustainability, the industry will face great ESG challenges in their business from global stakeholders. So also public as well, public also need to be more cautious in their uh, daily lifestyle, reducing energy, water, and material consumption. So the environmental sustainability in Qatar greatly influencing environment, uh, economic and social uh, development and sustainability. Thank you so much. And Mr. Mohammed, would you want to add to that? Um, thank you so much for having me in this uh, great panel. It's, uh, it's really appreciated. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for CM Today, sponsors, audience, my colleagues on, on the panel. If, uh, if I may start uh, with, uh, with the common definition that is being made according to the United Nations World Commission and Environment Development. The sustainability is about acting in a way to ensure the future generation have a natural resources available to live an equal, if not better, uh, comparing to the current generations. Uh, over the past years, uh, expanded th that definition to include the human needs, well-being, not only the uh, uh, including the non-economic variables such as education, health, uh, clean air, water, and protection of the, uh, the natural beauty. Uh, over, the, uh, over these years or the variation of this uh, uh, definitions for the sustainability, it has led uh, to one main thing, which is the role of the human, how he should play in this planet. Uh, over here in Qatar, they have uh, paid the uh, they have paid a great attention to the environment sustainability for present and for the future generations. They have provided uh, in order for them to provide a safe, healthy life and receive the environment. They have outli outlined this one in the environment sustainability strategy in 2017-2022, which is uh, one of the most important uh, pillars of Qatar uh, second national development strategy. Uh, this one it has in line with this contest, uh, the Qatar a permanent constitution uh, obliged the state uh, to take the following steps. Uh, you have to provide providing a healthy environment that ensure the future, uh, addressing the negative impacts of climate change, uh, minimizing pollutions, managing environment uh, protection and receiving the natural and the future as well. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can obviously see over here how Qatar 
uh, focus on on this one and their constitution and their and their and their and their also uh, all the articles has been came aligned with this one, and uh, that uh, also has been stipulated in their article number thirty three where they should protect the environment and maintain its natural balance to achieve a, a comprehensive uh, and uh, sustainable development for all generations. So uh, to conclude, just to say that Qatar has a place, uh, a priority in conserving natural resources and protect the ecosystems uh, and for this generation, for this current situation and for the current generations. Thank you for that insight. And Mr. Allen, would you like to add as well? Sure. So I think Mohammed's been um, reading pretty much the same definitions of sustainability that I have been reading. Um, so talking specifically about sustainable development, uh, and I would be looking at it from the community management perspective, in that how can community management or effective community management assist in sustainability? And as Mohammed has already said, sustainability is actually meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So sustainability in its pure sense is about resource. And uh, Doyen has already mentioned about resource management uh, and how that impacts upon sustainability. From, it's a, uh, you can look at it from a very simple perspective, from a community management perspective, what I think that um, Qatar can um, benefit from is the learning experience that's been had uh, in the likes of Dubai and, and perhaps even Abu Dhabi. In um, some of, in, in my opinion, um, the uh, opportunities that were lost uh, at the development stage. And specifically what I'm talking about is in order to be sustainable, you need to be able to measure what you're using and ensuring that you're minimizing the usage of that resource. So uh, at a very pure level, when a development is being planned from a community management perspective, it's very, very important to ensure that the uh, resources that are being used, and, and we talk about sustainability and resources in a development perspective, we're principally talking about the use of power, district cooling uh, for air conditioning, and those types of things, which are the very high cost and the very high impact sustainability um, drivers in any community that we manage in the Middle East simply because of the environmental concerns. So if we think about sustainability pertains to energy, in order to make a community more sustainable, and more specifically, if a community, as in Qatar, we see some huge multi, uh, master communities such as the Pearl Qatar, um, the Sale City, uh, enormous um, master community or master plan communities um, that are involved with, a, with a, a number of different components, whether they be residential, commercial, hotels, uh, mall shopping, mall precincts, sporting precincts. Just to give you a very brief example from a community management perspective, if you have a, a community, let's say it's a high rise community that has multiple use, it may have some residential apartments, it may have some commercial office space, it may have a hotel, it may have a retail mall. If you can't measure what each of those components are using in terms of AC delivery, for example, how can you then make that particular component become more sustainable? How can you how can you ask that component to actually um, reduce their um, resource intake in order to make not only that community more sustainable but the environment and the whole of the greater nation sustainability? And just to give you a very simple example, in Dubai there have been many many high rise residential developments which have been uh, constructed and developed without any thought towards measuring or recording the usage of district cooling in each of the apartments. On that basis, then, how can the individual apartment occupant uh, understand the impact that their AC usage is having on the overall usage of the building? And unless you actually are able to charge either a component like a hotel or an individual apartment for their usage, it's not going to have any financial impact on them, and they're not going to moderate their behavior accordingly. And so from a community, strict community management perspective, I would like to put out there that I think at the development stage, if you want to talk about sustainable development, you need to think about how a community, uh, firstly, 
uh, gets the distribution of utilities into that building and how you can effectively separate them between components and how you can measure what that each component or each individual unit is using. And if you don't do that, it's incredibly hard the development has been put up to then retrofit that type of measurement. And that is, to me, uh, one of the, the major lessons that's been learned in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. And I would like to think that Qatar takes that on board and, and makes ensures that they have a really, really good measurement capability. Right, some very key points there, and I'm sure you know we'll get into it in depth uh, during the course of the discussion. So, quite quickly, uh, Mr. Abi, uh, how about you? Would you like to add, uh, you know, what sustainability means? Yeah, I, I think I think I will go with uh, all the uh, fellow members in this uh, panel. Uh, sustainability is very important for Qatar, and as you know, that we contribute a lot of CO2 to the world being a small, tiny con uh, country producing a lot of gas. And uh, going back to Alan's comment about community and how the community drives it, right? I could see there's a lot of uh, involvement from government uh, agencies as well as the education institution. In the schools, they start kids how to be more sustainable, right? So it's all goes back to the end user's mindset how he thinks he should manage his infrastructure. And operators like us, uh, we have to enable our customers to measure it so that they can manage it efficiently and tell them how can we uh, enable them to achieve their ambition. So there is an ambition from the government as part of the Paris Agreement. And how are we uh, helping our customers and enterprises or cities or, or industries to meet that ambition intuitively? That's where I see uh, all of us uh, contributing to that uh, sustainability in the country. Thank you. And Mr. Sanjeev, how about you? In fact, I think, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. I'm actually having a very unstable uh, internet connection in here in the Netherlands. I don't know why. Uh, but I, I think Alan has nailed it. Uh, it's very, very true. What we are seeing all around is a lot of these new builds which have happened have happened without any uh, proper planning. I would say when it comes to deep dive automation systems, they've just been specced in, they are in, and that's it. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time upgrading a lot of these systems, uh, bringing them to a space where we can measure and record. Uh, the analytics have come in, and that's where the real meaning has come in. It's all happened actually after the COVID situation where uh, people started to look into savings, you know. So, you know, coming to Qatar with the end of the blockade, there is the resilience of the Qatari economy and the regulations, uh, the reforms, especially around foreign ownership and permanent residency requirements has made Qatar an, a, very, a very attractive destination for real estate and investors. So this is the time to look at what we have and what we are going to build uh, in the future to keep sustainability as a major uh, major factor into account because uh, you know if, if you look at automation automation itself is a 10 billion dirhams uh, industry per annum in the middle east and 1 billion itself alone in the uae and we are spending a lot of time upgrading these systems and if, if you see a lot of our projects which we've been doing these are all old legacy systems we are upgrading it and bringing it up to uh, to the to the fact that we can start measuring and recording them. So there's a lot of uh, work to be done on the uh, when it comes to prop tech is concerned. So this is my view. Thank you. It's quite interesting that you even got you know we can't ignore how pandemic has changed this whole thing. So I want to now move on to you know the behavior aspect uh, of the discussion and. Uh, Mr. Dern, I want to ask you, you know, post the onset of COVID-19, a lot of people have become more aware regarding, you know, the environmental impact as well. So has this kind of uh, change been observed in Qatar? Um, yes, of course. COVID-19 has significant, significantly influenced our lives in every corner. And especially new IT solutions have been rapidly adopted. Remote learning, working uh, are widely introduced and become a norm. It opens up the boundary and locational limits in the global communication and knowledge sharing. Also, uh, during the COVID-19, people realized how globalized we are. 
a problem started in on one small area, not just ended up in a local issue, it became a, a global issue, which cannot be resolved by one's effort. It requires a global coalition, global effort. So we work together to tackle the problem. Environmental uh, issues are also require such a global coalition. When you focus on COVID-19, last two years, 2020, 2021, our hottest year in the history. China and Germany experienced deadly uh, flooding while the west of the US faced historic drought. Canada and Southern Europe battled uh, uh, wide fires. Especially in Qatar, this summer was the one of the hottest time in the history. From May this year, the temperature already hit 48 degrees, was in the middle of summer from, the, um, in, from May. Probably uh, that's why more and more people read articles more about the environmental impact, environmental risk. And also I think uh, there are growing attention to uh, global warming, global action on Paris Agreement. After the, especially after the downturn, economic downturn in the COVID-19, countries over the world, they are focusing on, on green recovery with the investment on uh, environmental friendly technology and environmental friendly energy solutions. Especially in Qatar, oil and gas companies are quickly responding to this uh, direction. Recently, Qatar Petroleum, a national oil company, changed its name to Qatar Energy to become a total energy solution company instead of highlighting the fossil fuel energy. Many other oil and gas companies in Qatar developing such a new business strategy and plan to cope with the global request to limit environmental impact from their business operation. Yes, so answer is yes, there is a, a growing demand and there is obvious change happening in Qatar. Right. In fact, I read a news report uh, by the Boston Consulting Group that says that about 55% of Qatar consumers have reaffirmed their preparedness to incorporate more sustainable actions into their daily lives. Now, according to the survey that I read, uh, it said that about 76% of Qatar consumers are quite largely aware of the climate change and how the issue negatively affects the environment. And 60% of these consumers with knowledge of the implications also perceive that uh, it has a negative impact on the global environment. And in fact, 51% have already started believing that climate change is having a significant influence on our personal lives. But however, it was very interesting to note um, that Qatar only recycles, reuses, recovers only 10% of the plastic and metal waste. So my question again to you, Mr. Dion is, why do you think that there's, there's this big gap between awareness and actually you know, the green behavior? Yeah, that's very true. I think, I, I, I think Qatar is at the very early stage of a transition to circular economy and low carbon economy. As shown in the survey, uh, rapidly growing awareness in environmental uh, sustainability. I think it's, it's a remarkable achievement by many uh, public and private institutions who have heavily invested on their effort raising public awareness in the environmental protection and, and environmental sustainability. I trust uh, raising awareness is the first step toward the action. So high level of awareness, I believe it's, it's gonna be a, a promising signal for the positive action in the future. Of course, I think there is there'll be a, a time interval between awareness and behavior action. I don't think a customary daily lifestyle of people in Qatar can be changed immediately because most people are used to uh, to their existing lifestyle and pattern for a long time, which is, as you know, is a heavily resource consuming and behavior. Yeah. 
it also requires uh, somehow a compromise between their currently comfortable lifestyle and to new lifestyle which require additional effort, additional action on it. But however, when they pick up the learning curve slowly, the public will start to change their lifestyle and take an, an actual, actual action. I think to expedite this such an action by the public, first, as you mentioned, uh, uh, sufficient infrastructure should be provided to the public. So enough, for example, enough recycling bins and recycling facilities and uh, waste transportation systems. In addition, um, various incentive programs can be introduced by awarding benefits to the environmental friendly action to the public. Besides, uh, legislative enforcement can be also an option for strong action by the government to mandate public actions in the, in the citizens and, and residents of Qatar, I think. Right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Abi. I want to bring you into the discussion now. So when we talk about uh, green infrastructure, there are so many aspects that we need to consider, but the key thing is uh, the mentality of the customers or the end users. So can you shed some light on how acceptable has this concept been to them? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question, Mega, because uh, the mindset of the end customer or end users plays a big role towards uh, embracing the green infrastructure. Uh, in Qatar, as we all know, that there is a uh, there is a uh, vision statement says that we need to look at sustainability in every aspect of it. Um, I should say that there is now a broad consensus that sustainability development is the way forward. We have seen a dramatic shift uh, actually in the last few years in people's mindset. Sustainable development is one of the everyone's agenda today. Yeah? A decade ago, our conversation would begin with what is green infrastructure. But today, issues around sustainability are very well known to everyone, and uh, we can start the discussion at a much higher level. So, uh, as I told you earlier, we have seen uh, players in public and private sectors are now very keen to embrace green projects in the infrastructure development, aligned with the national vision. There are regulators uh, who look at GSAS audits for the new building. Uh, you know, so, something which has driven from the regulator side that all the new buildings should be looking from a, a GSAS, uh, you know, star certification, and 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 the people have started absorbing that as a one of their key uh, you know, ambition for that matter. Also to add that this organization are also under pressure from regulators, shareholders, and also the stakeholders uh, to embrace these kind of sustainable development. So there are already some kind of undercurrents in the play, which we can uh, begin the conversation with customers. Adding to the point which Alan already mentioned, the double deep impact of post-COVID economic realities. Uh, there is uh, tight budgets for customers. They are asking for, uh, or they are looking for financial benefits through energy and cost optimization models. So it is, uh, it is also worth to note that cost is always one of the first consideration for many end users in adopting uh, you know, green infrastructure. So uh, when, when the customer looks at the cost, it is uh, our uh, uh, you know, interest to show them or our uh, uh, you know, key focus is to demonstrate a very positive return of in investment uh, when implementing the green projects. So uh, to give an example, we are now uh, launching kind of an asset-based operations uh, where we say that, okay, if a customer wants to look at a green project or a, so something like a um, energy efficiency solutions. Uh, we can even look at their CapEx investment to convert an OPEX model so that, so that he knows that, okay, he has to spend so much of money over the next uh, few years. And uh, we have seen that when we demonstrate to the, to the clients the cost benefit of the lifetime of the project, or say that, okay, you can save the energy spent for 10 to 15 percent by doing this CapEx investment, they are really forthcoming for that. Now, going back to the same point earlier, say that when we measure it, we can manage it. Uh, when, when, we, when we show to the customer using the smart tools or energy management solutions, you say that, okay, the space which is uh, used uh, or having so much of uh, energy usage, and when it is not used, you still spend the same thing. So uh, when they see the 
the trends of their asset being utilized incorrectly, they are pretty, oh, then we need to do something about it. So there is a very good interactions nowadays with the customers in terms of energy savings, which is in turn reflecting on the ambition of the country as well as for the uh, um, uh, near future people in the, in the country. Thank you so much. I mean, now this kind of brings us, you know, to understanding the built environment a little more in depth. So I want to focus on that. So I want to ask you, Mr. Mohamed, I want to bring you into this discussion now. Uh, how have you seen this whole transition of the built environment as a whole uh, with respect to the Qatar vision of 2030? Just, uh, I'd like just to comment a few things about a few topics it has been very interesting. Uh, yeah. Just go through them very quickly. The gentleman over here has highlighted a very good point and uh, I believe that we should talk about them a lot. But um, the, the COVID-19 uh, impact has made uh, serious things over here about people to understand uh, that the impact of, of such a virus, it could be affecting not only a group of people here or there. Uh, it, 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 it will be the whole global as have been highlighted by my colleagues in there. So, um, and just to give an example for that, for that. So we've been always trying to highlight to our customers right now, the importance of cleaning of the ducts and making sure that all your uh, systems are working properly in sufficient way. Um, that was, was not, I'm not saying the client don't understand, but they don't see the impact, the real, the real impact on this. We've noticed right now there is uh, the clients start to understand, no, we have to maintain these kind of assets in a different way, which is indirectly is already right now affecting the sustainability as well. Um, we are talking about also, Abby, when he mentioned about the client understanding uh, right now, he wants to see physical, tangible things when you need to make the changes in, in there. So I can understand because end of the day, the client is, is myself, you and everyone. So the client, he starts right now when he starts right now seeing that right now FM impacts, uh, it touches his personal life. So he starts right now to understand the importance of sustainability. So he wants to see something tangible in order for him to move. Back to your question, the, the transition, definitely we all agree right now, Qatar has in terms of regulation rules, they have set uh, a lot of, of targets over here to achieve. And we, we can see there is a progress that's already going on with 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 set of examples. We can talk about, we have seen the changes on Mishrib uh, downtown in Doha. Uh, this uh, project is, is one of the distinguished project adheres to the highest green building management standards. We can see in Lucille City as well, where they accommodate the portion of Qatar projected uh, population and economic growth in according to Qatar uh, Vision 30. You can see as well uh, Qatar Foundation uh, and their initiatives has been taken as a good example, a real example about the sustainability and the green buildings. Uh, there are so many things over there. The good thing that you can see the targets that Qatar has been set uh, over here in, in terms of the green transportation, green transportation they're talking about 100% electrical bus transportation by uh, 2022. Uh, they are talking, they need to host the World Cup is gonna be the first uh, a carbon uh, neutral World Cup. So there is uh, uh, the good thing as, 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 as the gentleman said a while ago that, that the regulation, it's already in a place. Uh, uh, probably, yes, we are in the early stage right now in, in terms of implementation. Uh, there are some good examples and has been set on the country, can be seen on the country. Um, but um, it's, it's obvious right now, uh, the ultimate target, uh, uh, it's, it's good for the, for, the, uh, for the whole environment and the sustainability environment from my point of view. Right. And when we look at the facility management industry, can you shed some light on the kind of changes that you have observed in uh, the market? Yeah, obviously, if I, if I may start, there are, there are challenges first. We need to accept that there are a few challenges over here that we need to, to address. First, there is an environmental and climate features about the country and the region itself. And uh, there is a pollution growth uh, rate as well happening in, in this country. Uh, in fact, uh, achieving the environmental sustainability, it's, uh, it requires uh, an effective participation from all relevant parties. I believe uh, the awareness campaign is the first thing to start with. Uh, and uh, we have also as well starting right now to passing the 
became a quite essential to familiarize the individuals and entities with the existing initiatives and how they can be supported with, with different uh, channels. Um, over here, uh, how this impacted the, the facilities management, uh, the government basically has invested a lot of uh, in, in, uh, in sustainability cities such as Lusail and Musharab, and obviously uh, that requires the facilities management itself to contribute uh, to that vision and to maintain that standard has been set on that country. Uh, the construction in this, uh, uh, the construction industry also is booming due to the upcoming mega events like World Cup and the Qatar National Vision 2030 that create a massive demand on a property management services to meet the newly constructed building standards, as I mentioned. There is also an increased uh, need for clean facilities, a commercial drive category due to the growing in the footfall of tourists coming to Qatar. And last but not least is the green building. And uh, there, is a, there is a council already over here. It's uh, the Qatar Clean Building. Uh, they are right now trying to bring more attention to the high standards implementing the uh, GSAS system and trying to, de to develop the most comprehensive uh, standard uh, award in these, uh, in these buildings. Uh, there is a, a big chance. I think, I think uh, this is one of the, the facilities management are one of the first runner on, on, on this subject. Um, in addition to the government entities over here, um, the, the awareness right now, which is we are playing a major role on it, trying to implement it as, as, as uh, tangible results, trying to show them that the reduction in cost of the uh, electricity, water, uh, and trying to make sure all the time their assets is maintained very well. So I think there is a, a big opportunities for the facilities management coming, uh, coming forward in the coming years. Some interesting insights are there. I want to touch upon, you know, community management and technology as well before we get into some quite a few questions that are coming on from the audience. So, Mr. Allen, I want to ask you now, uh, you know, UAE has been at the forefront when it comes to community management sector in the region, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it has been quite prominent in Qatar as well. So, can you shed some light on this aspect? You're on mute. If I understand the question properly, uh, you're asking about my experience in Dubai and how that impacts upon what's happening in Qatar. Um, <clears throat> it's a very simple truth. That community management is the same. It doesn't matter where you, where you are in the world. Community management is all about taking a building and subdividing it into separate unit titles. And instead of having one owner of a building who's responsible for the management and maintenance of that building, you have a, a large number of individuals mm -hmm. who as a cooperative or a community have the responsibility for managing that building, which then makes it a little bit trickier because um, clearly those community or those unit owners have had no say in the in the startup of the building, if you like. And specifically, just talking about the Dubai experience, what we've found is that the the three contributors to, if we're talking specifically about sustainability and resource use, uh, at the very top of the pyramid is um, regulation. So you need a very strong regulator, federal, whether it's federal or um, Emirate or uh, a local regulator to be able to say things like uh, in any development, we will require individual units to be installed in every unit that uh, takes supply. Now, as an example, in Dubai, you have DIWA. And DIWA requires that every individual unit has its own DIWA number and receives its own individual bill. And therefore, you've got the person who pays the bill going around every moment, ticking off all the lights and turning off all the hot water cylinders, making sure that they're... Is down. Um, so at regulator or Emirate uh, to ensure that you've got that base. Um, and I say that because um, there is a lost opportunity there whereby with district calling, which has become the preeminent type of um, AC delivery in many developments, uh, also uh, in Qatar, um, the real lost opportunity was a regulation which required all developers to install meters in each unit and to have an end user account to bill each of those individual users. So that was a bit of a lost opportunity, really. Um, so the next thing you've got is that the planning and design stage where the developers have, um, because they don't have any regulation, they're going to take the line of um, 
least resistance, and they're going to put their building up. And if they're not required to put in uh, meters, they're not going to put the meters in. And that creates massive problems. And I can see Sanjeev nodding there because I'm sure that he's been involved in many, many um, uh, retrofit uh, scenarios where, for example, there's not enough room in the ceiling bulkhead to put a meter, you can't install it. It's just a lost opportunity. And at the third point, um, during the construction phase, you've then got value design decisions. So whereby there may have been a design which um, enhanced sustainability and resource use that was um, designed out because it became too costly to do. Um, and I'm sure that there's a lot of that goes on. So um, I think that to sum up from a community perspective, the lessons in Dubai that should be applied in Qatar, and I'm sure that you know, with the Dubai uh, Qatar Foundation and many others are doing this, you need to change behavior because resource usage is about human behavior. So the only way you can really change behavior is by some sort of repetitive action or by some action that's going to cause a reaction. And in my experience, the one thing that you can do to an individual consumer is charge them for the service. So if an individual consumer is being charged, let's say for district calling, uh, he isn't going to be opening all his doors and windows and running the unit at 18 degrees for 24 hours a day. He's going to be closing his doors and windows and he's going to be making sure that the AC is not on when it's not required to be on because it's costing him money. So uh, in, in a very great community management perspective, it's all about um, implementing measures which will change behaviour. And the only way that I know that you can really do that that's going to have any real impact is by making it hurt at the wallet because that's going to change behaviour. Um, so uh, it all sounds very basic and very simple, but I'm, community management is always very basic and very simple. Um, so if you do it right from the very get-go, and unfortunately many developers, many designers, many development companies that are putting up these huge master plan communities with massive multi-use developments don't consider the actual uh, after the building or after the development has been opened, what impact that's going to have on the actual residents. And I think it was um, uh, Abby or maybe Sanjeev that mentioned that, um, uh, where was I going with this? They, uh, they mentioned that service charges or the cost of maintenance of the building is one of the, the biggest issues that we face. People are very, very aware if they're an investor, it impacts upon their return on investment. If they're an individual living in a home, it impacts upon their cost of living. And so we're having a massive, massive um, um, pressure on community managers to reduce service charges. And you cannot reduce the service charges if you can't control consumption. So again, it comes back to that measurement aspect. And so I think that probably from a sustainability perspective and you know, being invited to this meeting from a community management perspective, it's about measurement and behavior and trying to change those things. And it can only be done at the regulatory level and the design level. Definitely. And Mr. Sanjeev, you know, uh, I wanted to come to you as well. Where can you kind of touch upon the kind of transition we've seen in the prop tech region? I mean, of course, it's been quite a buzzword across uh, different parts of the Middle East uh, in the last two years. But uh, in Qatar, how has the acceptance level been? I, first of all, I have lots to say, and I think mm -hmm. Alan has nailed it, you know. Uh, without a regulatory authority, then it becomes responsibility. And then it's a responsibility between some people who are responsible to be either uh, designers, consultants, uh, people who are responsible to uh, uh, take care of a whole project from uh, a design point of view and a performance point of view. Now, uh, you know, the, the automation is, we all understand automation. Automation has been, has come in in the early days for sustainability, for productivity, but uh, technology is moving very, very fast. And a lot of things are happening. I mean, we, we used to buy a TV without a remote control. Now we have a TV with a remote control. And now we have a TV with a lot of smart applications. So uh, uh, so the things keep changing all the time. And then now, now uh, with all these changes, we got to keep all these uh, factors in mind and make the planning. Now, we have the building automation already existing. 
These are systems which are from the past, as we say, building automation system. We are now talking about smart cities. So what do we do? Do we rip off all these systems and put new systems? No, we, we have to be, we are responsible. We have to be careful. So we have to take, uh, upgrade these systems, bring them to a space where they are sustainable, uh, they are, uh, as, as Alan pointed out, we measure and regulate them. I mean, uh, we, we, we actually measure and record them. And then comes in the analytics, which again differ. There are a lot of people talking about platforms. Uh, what do these platforms do? Again, there's a lot of data, a lot of information which keeps coming in. That data has to be intelligently analyzed. And there's a lot of practical work around it so that the person who's managing it has been managing buildings for years and years. Uh, it, has he done a good job? Uh, so what? how do you expect that person to actually analyze this data and uh, do the right thing? So there comes experience. There comes uh, experience behind the analytics. And what these uh, command and control centers should do is, uh, this is our aim all the time, is that give exact uh, uh, work orders and make sure that these things are taken care of and eventually, eventually the building has been performing the way it's supposed to perform. So prop tech, as you asked me before, is a very important aspect to make things, uh, to make these um, buildings uh, and uh, the sustain sustainability aspect to, to be the optimum and to the, to the maximum. And again, as I say, with the uh, analytics, we are talking about AI, we are talking about machine learning. There are a lot of aspects. We are talking about automation. We are talking about uh, integration between security and automation. We are talking about integration between fire alarm and automation. There's a lot of, uh, uh, the, there's a lot of work to be done in that aspect. And there's, there is work in progress. So if there is so much work in progress, uh, we have to be very careful when we design new projects, you know, we have to be very careful. It's just that we don't look at brand names and just follow uh, what the brand names are saying. I have been part of a brand, a very strong brand name, and we are still part of some strong brand names, but you've got to see the credibility behind what the, the, the people are doing and what they are currently doing. What are they doing with the existing projects? People design new projects and leave them. And uh, uh, most of the times we realize that it's all over spec or under spec. And either when it's over spec, you spend, spend a lot of money. When it's under spec, you, you spend extra money on variations. So these are challenges which uh, the industry is facing. Uh, yes, uh, on the good side, it's a, a, a Qatar, is like Dubai, I would say it's a great, great place where a lot of projects are coming in, a lot of opportunities there. And I think there are a lot of sensible people around where we come together and make sure that uh, we deliver and we give back what it really deserves. Thanks. So some very key insights that we've got uh, from all of you and uh, let me quickly get in, we've got some few questions uh, that the audience has asked, and let me just get into a couple of them before we come back to our discussion. So we have Mr. Mohammed Ifran, uh, who says that Qatar is one of the oil rich uh, countries. So convincing the client for energy saving is a little bit difficult. So in terms of emission reduction, is there any government regulation to private organizations in terms of energy management or emission control? Would anyone like to take that on? Oh, if I if I want to add to this, you know, um, uh, there is no official super ESCO or a regulator as of today in the in the country for B two B segments. Yeah, so B two C we have Tarshid who is uh, looking at the the consumer part of it, but there is a clear mandate from the government to the government employees, uh, sorry, the, the government companies that they need to look at their energy spent. Uh, keeping the fact that uh, the uh, non-hydrocarbon industry is coming up a lot, uh, and also uh, you know uh, the uh, the post-COVID impact, the double dip impact, right? It is forcing the enterprises to look at it. Now, convincing the customer is another part of it. It's like uh, you know until they know what is there in there for them. What, how much they can save, as as uh, Sanjeev told, they they really don't 
have that visibility of their assets, how it is performing. And there are one of my customers says that uh, over the COVID time, the in their facility was shut, but still his karama bill never went down, right? So these are the uh, you know insights which we give back to the customer, saying that customer, you need to really look at how your asset is being utilized, and that is where the prop tech and the operators comes in, uh, into picture and give them the visibility. That will surely uh, influence the person or the end, end client mindset that I need to save or I need to make sure that I have a very healthy environment for my end, end customers. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, there's a question directed to you uh, when you spoke about the green transportation. So Ms. Sheila asked that does green transportation could it probably mean end of gas in the future? I don't think uh, I don't think the gas is going to have an end for this one because there are special torpedoes is required the gas at all the time. Um, uh, when we are saying about this one, I think mixing the energies and in, and increasing the number of uh, or increasing the electrical buses transportation, uh, it means right now we are we are contributing to the to the to the planet. Uh, in, in order to reduce the uh, pollution. So, so, so basically uh, I think the energy resources right now, shifting right now the energy resources uh, from the, the, the traditional one that what we are doing right now, oil and gas uh, to the green ones, which is more into electrical, the solar right now, how things is moving right now. Uh, it, it, it takes time, it will take time because uh, all the, the, the machines, the equipment has been already built up right now based on, on, on that fuel or that uh, uh, power, how it's gonna be used. Uh, so, but ultimately, yeah, I think uh, we're gonna be reaching uh, uh, big time uh, to achieve at least, uh, or Qatar, I'm saying, sorry, Qatar is targeting at least to have 10% uh, electrical vehicles by 2030 uh, 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 running uh, by electrical. So um, as a conclusion, again, the, the, the mixtures between uh, having the normal energy resources right now and uh, how we are moving forward, it will take time, but it, 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 it will happen uh, at one, uh, one time, probably in the next generations. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I hope Ms. Sheila and Mr. Mahmoud, it answers your uh, question. So let's get back to our discussion. So far, we've spoken about the behavioral approach. We've spoken about, we've touched upon the transition in the built environment in Qatar. And now I want to, uh, you know, steer the discussion towards uh, the approach and the challenges towards green infrastructure. So I want to start again with you, Mr. Doyun. Uh, you know, what are some of the kind of demand factors that can drive green infrastructure? Uh, a rule of thumb, I think uh, economics will go the first. Economics has been the main driver for new uh, investment, infrastructure investment, and it continuously will be. But however, I think uh, rising the climate change agenda could greatly impact our future infrastructure to be greener. Many countries care declared already their net zero emission goal by 2050, which requires significant investment to reshape uh, our infrastructure. According to some news article, it will cost uh, up to uh, 10 trillion US dollars. So there is a huge investment potential will come to the infrastructure investment. And cost of renewable energy is continuously dropping. The technology of renewable energy continuously is improving. So renewable energy will definitely play a bigger role in our energy infrastructure. IT systems will be further integrated with the buildings to enhance the communication between the end user and uh, utility systems which will improve the overall utility system and efficiency. Um, already smart buildings and cities are, are booming up, but it will be even more widely applied to our society over the world. So which will trigger, trigger more interactive infrastructure system. And when it comes to the transportation infrastructure, 
electrification in transportation is going to be quickly introduced in the next decade. As Mohammed mentioned, 10% by 2030, such a goal is already mentioned in the, in the national vision. Electricity powered transportation system is, is gradually accepted by the public in Qatar. And especially that last week, Qatar announced a public transportation integration system called Fila, uh, uh, so which is connecting the metro, uh, um, other transportation, public transportation system together. And with this regard, I think uh, um, electric buses already introduced for the FIFA World Cup uh, 2022, already 9,800 electric buses were procured and even more number of electric buses will be introduced by a uh, more solid uh, public transportation system. So the new infrastructure, new transportation will be, I think, uh, when it's gradually introduced and the existing infrastructure need to be adjusted to the new technology, new system. Uh, so there'll be a, a, a demand for uh, the greener infrastructure in the, in the short future. Right. You know, now I want to steer into, we're talking so much about sustainability. So Mr. Mohammed, I want to ask you, how can assets be operated in a more sustainable way? Uh, definitely it's going to be incorporating with uh, with the practices and the standards has been already set within the organization structure the the concept that should be uh, following the level of performance in terms of services so there are certain standards has been set in order for us how to to maintain these assets we're talking about the iso standards in the first place talking about as well the sfg 20 to ensure the industry is, has a good practice to be followed. We're talking about the ON, ONM recommendations from the manufacturer, the operation and manufacturer. Um, there are also other tools has been comes in order uh, to maintain uh, the assets in a proper way. So obviously is gonna uh, give this one uh, longer productivity for that assets. And we make that assets right now and in, in maintain in a proper way like CAFAM system scheduling the a clear uh, maintenance regime for that assets. We are talking about uh, uh, backup systems is to make sure that there is a change over between the systems. So again, it will be working in a healthy, uh, appropriate way that uh, that assets. We have to develop and implement effective operations and maintenance policies and procedures. We have to make sure that the specialist uh, are, are, are working uh, on, uh, on this one. There are right now uh, uh, also a, a trend right now moving towards uh, uh, more economic economic assets. So it's our our own role. Whenever whenever that uh, uh, we maintain uh, the assets in a proper way, so definitely the efficiency is going to be better. So there is no more consumption. I believe uh, the gentleman has has touched this one before. So we're talking about um, the assets if it be maintained properly always. Uh, it will it will it will, it will give the best so the consumption it will be less so again it will affect as well the the environment so i believe the role that we are playing as a facilities management or all the facilities management are responsible right now in maintaining these assets in a proper way and according to the systems to the standards in order for us uh, to be a, a real contributor to the uh, to the market so there is a responsibility as well uh, towards uh, the society itself is to make sure these assets are is maintained according to the pre-mentioned uh, standard. Uh, you're inside. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you so much, Mr. Mohammed. I think we are almost kind of reaching towards the end of our discussion. So I want to quickly uh, touch upon a few key points. So I want to ask you, Mr. Abby, uh, you know, keeping this whole vision of 2030 in mind. And, uh, you know, can you shed some light on the whole evolution of the IFM companies to energy companies? 
Yeah, uh, so, so uh, I believe as an IFM operator, you are the most valuable partner for your customer because you manage the assets for them and you know what the problems are and how it's been utilized. So to uh, add to that fact that, you know, you, you know uh, the more you introduce the technologies, the more you introduce uh, the practices, the customer is more aware and he can take action. So you advise the customer as part of your journey, you advise the customer, these are the areas where we as an operator see the problems and this is how we can achieve together the sustainability uh, ambitions of you, right? Now, as an, it is very easy for an IFM operator to convert to a energy solutions guy because you, you, you know what uh, you are managing. So uh, introducing IoT-based solutions and prop techs, uh, as, as Sanjeev mentioned, uh, will enable you to offer the customers some performance-based uh, contracts, uh, KPI-driven contracts, which, which they can really look at, okay, uh, by doing these uh, changes, I'm going to uh, enhance my life uh, time of my asset. And I'm going to save so much of money in my OPEX, which can be further used for other things. And, and it is also contributing to the wider community in terms of uh, having a more uh, uh, you know, um, sustainable environment for the customers to use. So IFM uh, companies has to transform and it is a need. And we, we, have, uh, we, we, we transform ourselves internally as well as to the customer to enable them to achieve their ambition while we also achieve our ambition of net zero. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combined effort. We all have to work towards it. Definitely. And Mr. Sanjeev, I want to rope you in as well in this, you know, we've learned about how uh, as an asset we can be more sustainable, but how can companies take advantage of technology uh, to be more sustainable as well? See, as Abby pointed out very rightly that, uh, you know, you need to uh, make your internal improvements and then you give the best to your customers. When, do your, when you do your best for your customers, either it's in the form of service, technology, uh, it is never going to be unnoticed because you are actually giving a value. So once you give a value, definitely uh, that is sustainable, that is uh, productive, that is profitable, that is profitable for all parties. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an environment which is necessary. A lot of people look at short terms, you know, and short term is never profitable. I mean, it may be profitable for short term, but in the long run, it's never profitable. So if you always keep your customer in the forefront, okay, like we, we actually do that always. There are customers who come back to us and said that, uh, I think we need all this. So we said, no, you don't need all this. And we, we've saved the customers. Uh, we have a lot of testimonials to save the customers 75% of their costs. So uh, when you look at that, when you go with those values, for, for sure, it is, uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's a win-win for all parties. And I think we're all moving towards that. It's no more short-term goals. Uh, unfortunately, Middle East has been a transition place for a lot of people, but eventually that's changing now, you know? And I think all together, we, 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 we can make a big difference. So this is my viewpoint. Definitely. I think there's a lot of talk about including, you know, the community at large. So, Mr. Allen, you know, just to round things up, you know, looking at it from a very global perspective, at what stage can or should community management be involved here and how can they kind of contribute and help the community, you know, upkeep this whole green infrastructure that we're talking about today? So I think that really the important thing is the community management professional needs to be involved at the very design development stage. Um, so, you know, uh, all of the opportunities, the missed opportunities I've been talking about are generally as a result of um, lack of regulation and, and fail, failure to design. And uh, it can be as easily as, as in a multi-use building where you have a hotel component, it could be as easy as, as separating feed for district. The hotel components is using as opposed to the um, and there's there's many many ways a community management professional can assist in the design stage because a lot of the problems of allocating costs come about because resources that are used across a building um, and are need to be paid for by various components of the building 
need to be measured. And so the community management professional can see these um, issues at the very onset and, at the and, and make recommendations. So I think that from a community, a strictly a community management perspective, um, developers and uh, building designers should be very aware of the, um, the fact that um, a voice from a community management professional uh, is an important voice to be heard because of the massive impact it's going to have on, on the uh, one, the resource usage, and two, the cost of service charge and the allocation of service charges across components and units. So that, to me, would be um, a significant step forward. Right. I think it's been quite an insightful discussion. I wish, you know, we had the luxury of time to get more in depth into each of the verticals that we're talking out here, because I feel that there's so much more scope as well. But after all, at least there's a start to something. And uh, we hope that, you know, we can introduce more such engaging discussions. So thank you to each and every one of you. And also to the audience who were here with us today. And, um, uh, you know, we tried to take in more questions. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, we had, we didn't have the luxury of time. So again, thanks uh, to everyone for being here. Uh, you know, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So do have a look. And if you have any questions for any of our panelists, do, you know, address them uh, at the event feed and um, maybe one of you can you know take a look and address it to them as well reply to thank them you mega thank, thank you, you so much thank Have you very much guys thank you thank you so much